Yep, it should be recording. All right, what's up, everyone? How's it going? I'm Michael Rossetti. Today, I'm going to be presenting an open source app showcase, presenting an app that I created called GW Courses, which helps students find classes to register for, and it helps them uh, manage the registration process and know what courses are available. So um, I posted an agenda to Slack. I'm going to go into screen share mode. All right, so I posted this agenda to Slack. Here you'll see links to the repository on GitHub, as well as the hosted app, which is hosted on a Heroku server. So um, anyone at any time could check out the code and fork it if you'd like. And you can use the app. I would love for you to use it, I guess, uh, if you're a student watching this. All right. Uh, the motivation behind this app was that as a PhD student, I wanted to know what courses were being offered, and I wanted to have a um, CSV file of all the courses so that I could like manage them in a Google Sheet. So I created this app to help me, and then I deployed it to a public-facing server so that anyone could use it. So today, I'd like to demo this app for you and then talk about the process of developing it um, and managing it. And so also talking about some details about its functionality. So um, I'll talk to you briefly about how to get all of the requirements satisfied for this app, including setting up Chrome driver and a virtual environment to satisfy the application's dependencies. And then uh, I'll take you into the details of the application itself. It processes certain pages from the GW Registrar site. So there's like a web scraping component of this. And it uses Selenium to automatically browse. So um, I'll do a demo of headless versus non-headless mode, which could be kind of fun. I'll talk about how in order to make this work in a web application interface, I needed to hasten the performance. So I implemented multi-threaded processing. So I'll talk about that, how you could uh, run a process asynchronously, I guess, or in parallel using many threads. And then um, we'll take a look at the web application interface, which is a Flask application. So that's all focusing on the application's functionality. But then, um, my favorite part is managing this code. So that includes automated tests. Um, I'll show you how I use mock pages in the testing process to avoid unnecessary requests. And then uh, I'll talk to you about continuous integration via GitHub Actions, which I believe was a recent topic, GitHub Actions. And so I'll show you how I uh, am implementing continuous integration for this app via GitHub Actions, and also how I'm deploying to a production server using Heroku. So those are all the potential topics we could talk about. If anyone, if anyone is interested in any particular topic in, in more detail, once I get there, you can just kind of stop me. And at any time as I'm going through this, if you have questions or if you want to talk about or ask questions about a particular topic, feel free just to interrupt me and we can um, talk about anything you find interesting. This agenda is kind of more aspirational. It gives me something to remember to talk about if, if we need it. All right, so that's an overview of our agenda or some topics that I'll be talking about. So what I'd like to start with is a functionality demo. A disclaimer, when I was getting this app set up, today and updating some Chrome things. I actually think I broke my Chrome, so I'll be using Firefox for this demo. And so, um, all right, just visiting this link that I shared to the hosted app in Firefox. I'll show you what this app is about. So I made this app before the moniker change, so I probably should change the name, but that's kind of tangential. So this app is GW Courses. And on the homepage, you're presented with this form. 
So the form allows you to select a semester, spring, summer, or fall, and a year. And it, it currently defaults to this year. And as the next year comes up, it'll use the next year automatically. So that hopefully in years to come, you could still use this app. So after choosing a semester like spring of 2025, you also choose the subjects you're interested in. So as a PhD student, um, was only interested in a handful of subjects. And so certainly for people's majors, they might only be interested in a handful of subjects. And so you can denote those subjects using commas here. Um, so I have computer science and EMSE, but if anybody else has any departments you'd like for us to add, I'd like to invite audience members to give us another department or two. Political science. Yeah, what is that, PSC? I think so, yep, PSC. All right, we'll see. All right, cool, sounds good. So basically for all of these departments, the app is gonna go scrape the bulletin, process many pages worth of data, compile it all into a CSV file for export. Here we go. I'm gonna search for courses. Hopefully PSC is the real uh, abbreviation. All right, so I should probably put a spinner there to let you know that it was working. But uh, hey, it finished, it found 422 matching courses across those three subjects, and now presents us with the opportunity to download that CSV file. So I'll download the CSV file, and then we'll open it up just to show that it worked. All right, so then, what I would do as a student is just import this into Google Sheets and then apply my own filters and then kind of use this data to support my decision-making process, sorting by like location or time range or whatever. And so, yeah, here we have all the EMSE classes and uh, the political science classes and the computer science classes all in one place at the click of a button. And we didn't have to go clicking through multiple pages and like copy and pasting some data. We just have this now in a CSV file. So this was an app functionality demo and it kind of just uses some simple, uh, the scope is kind of small. It's like, hey, search your departments and get a CSV file. But I think that's all I needed to really be of value in my course registration process. If the course registration system were open or if they had APIs or whatever, we could do more to integrate into the course registration system itself, but right now that's not possible. So this is just for preparing and uh, planning purposes. All right, so that was a functionality demo. At this time, I'd like to take you into the code. We'll pull back the curtain and see how all of this is working. So I'm going to um, encourage you to check out the repository on GitHub. I will bring up this code locally. I have it all set up. I'll talk to you a little bit about what is required to get an app like this set up. Chrome driver being the hardest part in this process to, to get working. After I talk to you about the setup, then I'll run some local demos using different parts of this app that I've separated into different like logical concerns. So we could run them separately and test them in isolation. So there's different parts or um, there's different responsibilities of this app. One is in parsing a given web page. So once we navigate to the GW Bulletin, being able to process the contents on it, um, and then also being able to drive or navigate to different pages using Selenium. So uh, let's get into a little bit of an overview. I'm going to bring up this code locally. All right. 
So in terms of the setup process, this app requires Chrome driver. And so on a Mac, I'm using Homebrew to install Chrome driver. Um, Homebrew is like a easy package manager for Mac that allows you to install lots of underlying software like Chrome driver, like databases, like programming languages. And so um, it can make this process easy. So um, using the Homebrew command line tool here to install Chrome driver. And then one interesting thing about this process is that after time goes by, and when Chrome driver needs an update, um, it needs to be in sync with a locally installed version of Chrome. And so um, you can install both via Homebrew and using Homebrew to install the binary version of Chrome allows Chrome driver to control the Chrome browser. So there's two setup steps here to install Chrome driver and the Google Chrome binary. And I'm using Homebrew to do that. And this morning when I was trying to update things, I think I broke my real Chrome installation. So I'll have to check out what's going on there after the presentation. Um, when you're using Chrome driver on a Mac, you might have to like say it's a trusted app from your security settings. All right. So once Chrome driver is installed, then we should be able to use it. And um, so another part in this prep process is setting up a virtual environment. And so I like to use Anaconda to set up the virtual environment here with a conda create command, specifying which version of Python should be installed in this environment. And then after creating that virtual environment with the given version of Python, then we just activate it to start using it. So here in my um, terminal app, you can see that the courses environment is active. And once it's active for the first time, uh, we just need to install any third-party packages that this app requires. As a best practice for managing applications in Python, I've stored all of the package names in the requirements.txt file, which is in the root directory of the repo. And using a requirements.txt file is a best practice, and it also signals to humans and servers alike that this is a Python app. There's some Python things going on here. So this app uses a bunch of packages. It uses the .env package to read environment variables, and I'll show you some of those. Um, it uses the Selenium package for automated browsing to navigate to different pages automatically. I'll do a demo of headless versus non-headless browsing in a moment. It uses the beautiful suit package to process HTML web pages. So once we navigate to the given page, we'll use beautiful soup to kind of find the parts of the page that we care about. Uh, this app uses the pandas package to package up all the data in a data frame and export to CSV. And so that those packages are needed for the command line version of this app to just go fetch the data and export a CSV file. But what you saw from the demo is that I implemented a web app interface. So for the web app interface, we're using the Flask package and some other related packages here to make it work. Uh, we're using PyTest for testing. I believe that was the topic of a recent um, uh, event at Coders. So we're using PyTest. I'll show you some of my tests in a moment. And then to get the production web app working on a Heroku server, we're using the GUnicorn package. So those are all the packages that this app needs to work. And a single installation command can install all the packages from there. Um, so after we installed Chrome driver and managed it and updated it using Homebrew, after we set up a virtual environment and installed all of the Python packages that this app needs, we're ready to run the app. 
So um, if anybody has any questions about the setup process, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move forward into doing some local demos of the different pieces of functionality. Yeah, I just mentioned that if you look back into the history of GW coders, we did a session on Selenium maybe two years ago. That's right. Um, so if people are curious just about Selenium itself, how Selenium works and when it's useful and not, um, that was a pretty good session a while ago. Mm -hmm. So we can check out the archives for the video, I guess. On Zoom. I mean, not on Zoom, on YouTube. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, maybe I'll just make some high level points about it when, when I get into it. All right. So. I want to show you how I structured the code. There's a lot of functionality, but I want to talk to you about different pieces of this app one at a time. So first let's talk about page parsing. So in this app, I created a class called the parser. which takes an HTML file as its input and will output a list of courses. This was my original parser class before I implemented uh, the web application interface. So the first iteration of this, what I did was I used Selenium to save a copy of the HTML file locally and then use this class to parse that local file. But after I implemented a web app interface and when I wanted to deploy to a server, um, I believe the servers are ephemeral and the files that get written like aren't reliably there. So instead of writing the HTML page to file, I needed to update this process to actually process the page in memory. So, uh, I implemented this other version called the better parser, I think. Let's see. Better parser. Okay. So this class takes in as its input the actual page contents so that we can do this in memory and we don't need to write these HTML pages to file. And so that's what actually facilitates being able to do this in a web application and also prevents unnecessary files from cluttering the file system. So basically the way that this parser class works is we pass in some HTML string and then use the beautiful soup package to pick apart different pieces of the page. And then finally uh, return a list of the courses. So I guess on the registrar's website, there's a table element with certain class. And so that's what we're using beautiful soup to go find. I think there's many tables. So we're finding all of those tables with course listings and looping through them and collecting um, courses from each one. So here's just some example code of like using beautiful soup to find the tables, looping through the tables, finding certain rows in each table. Um, and then further finding certain parts in those tables that we care about. Finally, packaging up each course in its own dictionary and collecting that for later. So um, from the registrar's website, we have the availability, the CRN, the subject, uh, the title, the instructor, the location, all that data that you saw come through to the CSV file. And we also have a data frame version of this courses list. So what I wanted this class to do in terms of its responsibility is only be responsible for taking some HTML content, like a given page and returning a list of courses. So that also allows us to test the parser in isolation. So I guess I'll jump around a little bit in my demo, but I just wanna to talk to you about automated testing at this time. So 
Um, I actually implemented a test for the original version of the parser. And so what you'll see here in this test of the original version of the parser is that it's reading some local HTML file that I saved in the test directory. So I would call this like a mock page. So even if the registrar website is down, we have some version of this page to test out our parsing capabilities. So I save that in the repository itself. So here in the test directory, uh, there's like a mock, let's see, mock exports for the EMSE department, the first page for the EMSE department. So I literally just saved that HTML page into the repo. And now we have like a file to use for testing. So this helps us reduce unnecessary requests during the testing process. And it also helps speed up the testing process so that when we just want to test our parser's ability to find certain pieces of the page, we don't also need to keep requesting that page over and over from the registrar website. So kind of using modularity of the code um, allows us to kind of test the parsing capabilities in isolation. And for this parser test, I'm basically just reading that HTML file, passing that file to the original page parser, and then asserting that it returns a list of 20 courses. And that the first course looks like this. So this test is ensuring that the parser class is actually able to read the page. And I'll just run this real quick, this test from the command line. Hi test, run something named the parser test. Cool, so passing, awesome. So the parser capability is working. So once we have the contents of a page, we can parse it and pick out all the courses from there. But how do we actually navigate to all these pages and loop through them? Let's check out the web driver functionality. So I just talked a little bit about page parsing using beautiful soup. Um, but now I'd like to talk to you about web, web driver using Selenium. So in order to see if the driver is working separate from its mission to go loop through all these GW registrar pages, I just wanted to implement a simple function that would return the web driver. And so we could use it to kind of test out to see if the web driver is working. And then if it's working, we can set the web driver to do all of the tasks that it needs to do in parsing the courses. So I set up this driver file and there's just a single function in this file. The function returns an instance of the web driver. And so this web driver is set up using various environment variables about where the Chrome driver tool has been installed via homebrew and where the Chrome binary path has been installed. So by using environment variables, this allows us to customize these paths on our computer. And so also other people running this app could set their own paths in a flexible way using environment variables without having to change the code. So you'll see here in my .env file where I'm storing these environment variables is the path to my Chrome binary. When we deploy this to a server, we'll need to also install Chrome and the Chrome binary on the server, but then we can point the server to wherever those tools got installed. So using environment variables here gives us flexibility. Normally we would use environment variables for security reasons. And I do have some Google related environment variables hidden below that are pertinent to um, some piece of the web application. But here we're using environment variables for customization purposes so that when you run this on your computer, you can just 
specify where your Chrome binary is installed. And when I run this, I can specify that for myself and we can share the same code. So the .env file is where we set these environment variables and the web driver is looking at some of these. The other option that I'm passing into this function is whether or not to put the web driver in headless mode. So headless mode um, allows us to run the web driver in an automated way without some browser window popping up. So I'd like to demo for you now the difference between headless and non-headless mode. And this file, the driver file, at the bottom, we're using this Python convention, the main conditional, to allow us to import this function from this app without executing the code below that actually uses the web driver. And so this is what facilitates testing of the driver. We can import this function into a test and test it out, but we can separately also run this file from the command line. And when we run this file from the command line, anything under the main conditional will be executed. So in Python, the main conditional is a convention that helps us import cleanly from this file without also invoking some of the functionality. And it allows us to invoke this functionality only when we run this file from the command line. So I'm gonna run this file from the command line now, and we'll see that we'll get a new instance of the driver. I set the web driver to go navigate to the GW Coders website, and then I dropped a breakpoint to allow us to investigate if we want. So maybe I'll print the driver's title to see the page title. So I'll do this in non-headless mode first, and then I'll put the driver in headless mode so that you can see the differences. All right, Python, run this app.driver file. And here I'm using the environment variable headless mode to designate whether or not to put this in headless mode. So I'll start with false. If it's not in headless mode, we're gonna see a browser window pop up and it's gonna automatically navigate to GW Coder's website. All right, no hands. I love doing those kinds of demos. All right. So we see that it navigated to GW Coders and uh, that's great. Now we can ask certain parts. Now we can ask questions about this page, like what is the page title? All right, GW Coders, very cool. And this driver also will give us the source, the HTML source for a given web page. And so it's the source that will feed to the parser that I showed you a few minutes ago. So this was non-headless mode where we see the window. And um, if you're doing some web scraping, uh, actually I will put the web scraper in non-headless mode later and we'll see it uh, loop through some pages. So that could be fun. But anyway, I'm just gonna quit out and exit the file. So what I'm gonna do now is put the driver in headless mode and we'll see that we won't see any windows pop up, but still the work is being done. So we still now have access to go check out the page title, but all this is happening without those browser window. And so if you wanna deploy a web scraper onto a production server there, you have to put it in, in um, headless mode because there's no like windows popping up there on the server. All right, so this was the web driver in isolation. We were able to use it and run it separately using this separate driver file where this function was defined. I also have a driver test, which is a really simple test. It's just gonna go navigate to this URL in headless mode and then assert that it went to the right place. So I'll just run this test quickly before we move on. Hi test, run the driver test. 
all right, it passes, great. So separately, now I've tested that the page parser works in isolation given some example HTML contents. And I've tested that the web driver is able to navigate. And so now let's put all of this together and make some magic happen. So um, next I'm gonna do a demo of the processor. I called it the browser class. The role of this browser class is to, for a given subject and a given term and a given campus, go navigate to GW courses, um, navigate to my GW, uh, slash courses, I guess. And then what it's going to do is process that page. And then it will have a list of all the courses on that, on all the pages. So it's going to loop through all the pages and find the next link on each page and click it. So I think it would be helpful if we actually view the URL here. So um, do I have a browser test? Let's see. No, what I'm going to do is run this browser program, but I'm going to drop a breakpoint once we have in the instance of the browser before we go ask it to do all of its work. And then we'll see what the URL is and I'll visit that URL in the browser. So we'll take a look at what this page is that it's processing. So I'm gonna run this better browser right now. I've set up some environment variables to allow us to customize which campus and which term we want to use. So I think as a term, I'll choose 2025-01, which is spring 2025. So I'll pass those environment variables in from the command line term ID equals 2025-01, I think. And now Python, go run this better browser. All right, so the browser has a URL, uh, the base URL. Let's go check it out. So I'm gonna visit this in the browser. And I'll share it in Slack as well. So you can see like the page that is being read by this app. So just sharing this in Slack. All right, cool. You'll see on this page, like we just have to roll with whatever the page gives us. So it is necessary for this app to work that in the URL, we're designating the subject. And so that's what allows us to browse the courses for a given subject. We just point our app right there to the subject and to the given term and campus. And so now we get a list of courses for those, for that campus and that, that subject. So here we also see though that there's like six pages worth of courses. So we have like a number of tables here. And so when we loop through all these tables, each one has its own course information. So basically the parser is gonna take this HTML content and loop through all the tables and collect all this information. And the driver is going to navigate to page one, page two, page three, et cetera, using this next, play, next page link. So, we can manually click this next page link and get to the second page. And that's what the driver is going to do as well. Let's go check out the code. So after we initialize this browser instance with a given campus and term and subject, and it has its own URL, now we can ask it to go process all the pages. So it, has an instance of the web driver that we talked about a moment ago. 
It sets up an empty list to collect all the courses. It tries to get the first page and then it processes that one page and adds all the courses to its running list of total courses. Then it finds the next page link. And as long as there is a next page link, it will click it and repeat the process of parsing that page and finding the new next page link. So in a while loop, we're looping through all of the next pages and collecting all the courses from each page. After we're done, we're quitting out of the driver and returning the list of courses. So I'm gonna run this locally in a moment. You'll see that when we're parsing each page, we're taking the page source from the Chrome driver and passing that into our parser class and getting the parser's courses back. So that's kind of how all the pieces, the individual components of this app, which we were able to run and test separately in isolation are now being composed together and orchestrated. So I'm gonna run this locally and I'm gonna run it in non-headless mode. And what is it gonna do? It's just gonna display a data frame of the courses. So I'm just gonna quit out and actually run this file for real. And I'm gonna put it in non-headless mode. And we'll see, it's gonna hopefully loop through some pages. Here we go, moment of truth. Oh no. What just happened? Give me a moment. Oh, process pages. All right, cool. I think uh, hopefully that's gonna actually work. Let's try it out. Here we go. So we're looping through the pages, collecting the information. And um, we're in, I guess in this case, passing back a list of the courses. I just need to make that a data frame. So I should have run this beforehand. There's a little bugginess in some of it. So the better parser. So here I have like a list of the courses. So I'm just going to print the first few. All right, let me do that again. All right, there we go. Cool. So I actually got that data. And hopefully that was a fun demo, seeing the, the, the web driver loop through all the pages uh, in an automated way. So that's really cool. For a given subject, we can go get all the courses. But you'll notice that in the web application interface, we're allowing someone to specify multiple courses. So in order to get that working in a, a amount of time that's going to not lead to timeouts when running from a web interface, I needed to implement some threaded processing so that we can, instead of fetching the courses for one co for one department and then afterwards doing the next and then afterwards doing the next, we can process them in parallel. And that's what the next topic is about, um, multi-threaded processing. How are we doing on time? Do we end at 1230? Yeah, usually we end at 1230. Um, right. If you want to go a little longer, it's fine too. Um, some people may have to, I think JP has to leave to go teach. Um, and, uh, okay, I'll try to wrap up pretty quickly. Catch a train. I was just uh, um, I do have to yeah. <laughs> I'll wrap up in the next eight minutes, seven minutes. Great. So, um, just for the reason I said, like in order to get all of this working within a reasonable amount of time, when there's multiple subjects, uh, I want to talk to you about threaded processing. So. I guess the other option too, we have another open time 
coming up at the end of November, like the week before Thanksgiving. Do you want to come back and do, because the flask piece, the other pieces on your list are all really interesting too, but I don't want to shortchange threaded because parallel processing is very helpful. Um, do you want to come back and do the next part of it in a couple of weeks? Um, maybe we could talk about that. Let me see if what I can get in on time and then uh, we can talk about like next steps. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so let's see. Reddit. So I made another version of this tool called the multi-subject driver. And so it takes a list of subject IDs and a, a number of workers to use in parallel. So it's using the concurrent futures module in Python, and it's using a thread pool executor to assign a task to different threads and have them process in parallel. And then once they're all done, then we'll get all their results using this as completed method. So we're using the concurrent futures module in Python to do this threaded processing. So here I have this class called the multi-subject browser. It takes in much of the same information as we saw the, the last browser does, like the term ID and the campus ID, but this one takes a list of courses, oh, excuse me, a list of subjects. So what it will do is browse to a given subject and return the courses. Um, and for each subject, it will go browse that subject and return the courses. But how does this threaded process happen? Let's take a look at this function that I called fetch all courses threaded. which is used when we run this file. So I guess I implemented a, a, a way to run this in threaded and run this not in threaded mode. So let's check it out and see how it goes. I think we'll hit, oh, here we go, here we go. This is great. I actually am making a data frame this time. All right, great. So what I think I'd like to do is run this in non-threaded mode. We'll see how long it takes. And then we'll run it in threaded mode and hopefully see that it takes shorter period of time. But basically the way this code works is it uses this thread pool executor using the max number of workers. And now we loop through each subject and campus, I guess. And go tell that thread to go browse that subject and return its results. And then we're collecting those results. So because this threaded processing is um, happening not in sequence, it's happening in parallel, we're not really sure like which one's gonna finish first. So that's why we use this concept of the futures. So once all of them are done, as soon as they're all completed, now we'll take a look at their results. It's kind of like the thinking behind this. So, all right, let me run this for you. The multi-subject browser. So I'm gonna do this in non-headless mode. No, I'll do it in headless mode and we'll see how it goes. So I think I'll also specify 2025. All right. So it's going and getting two different subjects. First, we'll do it in not threaded mode. So it's gonna take some time to process each one. Here it's going through all the pages for computer science. And now it's going through all the pages for EMSE and now it's done. So there you see it went in sequence. But if we run this again 
in threaded mode, hopefully it's going to go in parallel and we'll finish in half the time. So you see it's working on multiple. If we check out the logs here, it was processing both page ones at the same time, both page twos. So it went in half the time. And if we add another subject, it will just go in the same period of time. So this was an essential step to getting this work in a web app interface, because in a web application, you only have so much time, like maybe like a few seconds before the server times out. So it's essential that we needed to implement threading to make sure that this runs in a time that's acceptable to be run in a web app interface. So with all of this in place, now we can include a web application interface using Flask. And maybe I'll talk about that later. But what I'd just like to finish up with right now is I did some demos of that of the automated tests but i just want to show you continuous integration and then i'll end and then if we want to talk about flask web application another day we can do that so to end my presentation i'll just show you how i implemented continuous integration so those tests that i was running locally to make sure and see the app worked um, i also wanted to implement those using continuous integration so Basically, the local file governing the continuous integration process is this GitHub workflow file. And if you're familiar with these, like from a recent presentation, um, here we can see the different steps that this workflow uses. So it's going to check out our code. It's going to install Python. And then it's going to install all the third-party packages using pip. So that same pip installation command that I gave locally to go install all those packages from the requirements file, that's getting done on the CI server as well. And in order to do the driver test, we need to install Chrome driver. So luckily someone created a Chrome driver GitHub action. So we're using that to install Chrome driver on the server and then finally running PyTest. And that's how we implemented continuous integration. And what you could see is that um, when we push code, like I just pushed an update to the readme file earlier this morning, it's running those tests and we're getting that green check to show that the code is working. So um, that's part of the process of managing this app is to just like make sure it's working, especially if multiple people want to contribute. Uh, now, if someone submits a pull request, but if it's breaking, now we'll see it and um, know if the tests are passing or not without having to run those tests locally. So that's helpful for collaboration. And here we see the tests are passing, so that's great. And now that's a signal that we can deploy this code to a server. And I deployed it to a Heroku server. And in that process, there's a proc file that governs what process will run on the server. So we're just going to tell the server to go run that web app. And that's the app that you can use in the browser that I shared a link with you a few minutes ago at the beginning of the presentation. So I would encourage you to Share that link with your friends or with your students, this link to the hosted app. And uh, I'd love for folks to, to use this. And hopefully it'll be helpful for people other than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wait, so thanks. For advising too, for faculty. Again, if for students who aren't just in one department, advising can be like, what are all your elective options? I get this all the time in data analytics because it's a joint program between two departments. So it's like, what should I take next spring or what's some good electives? And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't even know if this course is going to run next semester. Like, <laughs> you know, it's really hard to find that. It's not easy to immediately find it. So I just be like, download, here you go. Here, these are these are actually going to be offered in the spring for you, <laughs> right? And so you can look through that. Um, I have my running lists that I send to people, but... Is there any yeah, reason you don't put it up on the website, like <clears throat> the data frame? Like 
you only have to download the CSV. You don't show the data frame itself. Is there a reason or you just didn't? We could show it. So pull request welcome uh, if we want to show <laughs> it there. That's, okay. There, there will be hundreds of records. So we'll have to implement some pagination in that table, but there's plugins to do stuff like that. I think I just wanted to keep it simple and I know that I'm going to need to want to use spreadsheet software. So that was my workflow, but I think that's a really great idea to implement some more kind of visual of the results in the website that you could click through and maybe just browse there. Yeah. I'm just thinking of less technical colleagues who again are doing advising and might want to see quickly what is the list of courses to show the student who's sitting there asking what should i take um, yeah i think that's a really good idea and a great use case to think about like an advisor sitting there with their student so perhaps some next features would be to take the resulting courses and be able to like filter them more i know that that's some feedback that i got um, from some students that were wanting to help out with this is they wanted to implement some filtering based on day or location or something like that. So yeah, PR is welcome. This is open source. <laughs> and uh, if anybody's interested, especially people watching this back, if you're interested in collaborating, let me know. Um, and uh, we can get you plugged in. So thanks everyone for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, um, Michael. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is don't underscore don't underestimate the importance of turning the driver off. Yeah, quit the driver. I had that issue on a web server and it just went high. It will eat all your memory very quickly if it keeps the drivers on. Ooh. That big fat cat. That is a good cat. So. Pink fan, what's your cat's name? Pinocchio. Pinocchio? Yep. I love it. It doesn't speak.